Good morning on this lovely Friday morning as we begin our session for the day, the final day of the Atlantic Theological Conference. As we begin, I say opening prayers and then a couple of brief remarks and announcements. And following that, Father Tom Curran will take over to chair and moderate this morning's session. I ask you to stand for opening prayers. Direct us, O Lord, in this conference and in all our doings with thy most gracious favor and further us with thy continual help that in all our works, the gun continued and ended in thee. We may glorify thy holy name and finally by thy mercy obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And in this octave of St. John the Baptist, we continue to use daily the collect appointed in the prayer book for the nativity of St. John the Baptist. Almighty God, by whose providence thy servant John Baptist was wonderfully born and sent to prepare the way of thy son, our savior, by preaching of repentance. Make us so to follow his doctrine and holy life that we may truly repent according to his preaching. And after his example, constantly speak the truth, boldly rebuke vice, and patiently suffer for the truth's sake through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Now, addressing those of you who are here present in the church this morning, as well as those with us virtually on Zoom, just two things I want to mention quickly. For those who may have missed the conference Eucharist on la online last evening, it will continue to be available on YouTube to be viewed at any time. Simply go to our conference website and then follow the link to the YouTube video of the conference Eucharist. And for those who may have missed the excellent presentation by Terry Waite yesterday afternoon, I believe it will be available online in due course, or at least excerpts from it will be. So just keep checking our conference website, which will be updated in due course to make that information known. Now I turn things over to Father Thomas Curran. Thank you so much, Peter. I would like to begin by saying this is the most perfect occasion relative to this conference since uh, it has as its speakers, as you'll see, Patricia Chalmers and Christopher Elson. And it is the perfect occasion because Patricia Chalmers is the inspiration for the entire conference because of her deep insights into the theology of place, of which you'll be hearing more, of course, throughout the conference. The other reason this is the most perfect occasion is that Dr. Christopher Elson was made a Chevalier of France by the French ambassador to Canada on the very evening of the very day on which the world watched with horror the burning of Notre Dame de Paris. And so it is a remarkable grace that on this occasion, on which Christopher will be returning to the French nation, the highest compliment he can possibly pay by enabling us all to consider the place of Notre Dame de Paris in the history and development of France and its future. Dr. Christopher Elson is a loyal Nova Scotian who attended the University of King's College in Halifax and did his graduate work at the Department of French, Dalhousie University. His doctorate was received at the Sorbonne where he had the privilege of meeting many key modern French thinkers, not in textbooks alone, and not in volumes of poetry, but in the flesh and was able to have conversation with them. 
the chief one that has defined decades, I think, of Christopher's life is the friendship that he developed with Michel de Guy. And it is the subject of his most recent scholarly work, which has the appropriate title, In the Name of Friendship. Follows on from a, another volume that Christopher produced also concerning de Guy, who is described as a man of little faith with of course all the irony that it implies. In the name of friendship is an exhaustive and definitive account of this most significant and essential work of scholarship in the assessment of de Guy's thought. Dr. Christopher Elson is defined as so many are in this conference by his sense of service. Thinking of others immediately when I say these words, but for Christopher, this involved years of effective and overwhelming condition of, if I can pull it this way, indentured servitude as head of the French department, possibly in two iterations or even three, but also as the vice president of the University of King's College. On the 1st of July, he shifts gears tremendously, but not by departing from service as the editor of the Dalhousie French Studies and as the incoming coordinator of both Canadian and European studies. I have to say on a personal note that Dr. Elson and managed to continue his career as a amazing jazz pianist in Paris. Thank you for coming back to Nova Scotia so that we can enjoy it here as well. And he tells me that his most recent project, which is for him a fulfillment of a kind of life ambition is to be working with Izzy Coote on the two novels by Frederica Amalia Finkelstein. One is called Deep Vellum and will be published by Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies and the University of Dallas. Thank you for taking time off from that project in order to enable us to reflect on Notre Dame de Paris. Thank you so much, Tom, for those two kind words. You neglected to mention the tremendous help you provided me in reviewing uh, the manuscript of A Man of Little Faith. Uh, your comments on the introduction were invaluable, and uh, this is one of the many things that, that link us. Um, Notre Dame de Paris, the theology of its place. Just a word on the title. You'll note a slight discrepancy between the title announced in the program and the one before you today in your hard copies or on the screen. In my early exchanges with Father Max and the possessive genitive it's, was part of the title that was proposed and that I had eagerly, if cautiously agreed to work with. Later, without really noticing it, the it's seemed to disappear, but I want to restore it, at least provisionally, with a bracketing. No doubt a characteristically French theoretical gesture, but please don't snicker that, of course, a French prof would pull something like that. Um, I hope that it's not a reflex or a gimmick, but rather a way to recall and to get at two or three important orientations of what it is to think about theology and place. The bracketed it's allows me an approach that can aim in the impossible ambitiousness of this title at both a reflection on what the cathedral's meanings might teach us about a theology of place, the theology of place, if such a singularity exists, and about what a theology of place oriented by the 850 plus year old Notre Dame Cathedral that suffered such terrible damage from fire on April 15th, 2019, both contributes and owes to its own particular place. Situated as it is on the Ile de la Cité at an ancient and prehistoric crossing point on the River Seine, right at the heart of Paris, the European capital that capitalizes more intensely than any other, I think, the historical presence and meanings of the medieval church and its subsequent evolutions and confrontations with modernity. 
The traces of the vandalism of the revolutionary period during which the regicide was reenacted, acted out in acts of symbol, symbolic violence uh, against the statuary of the portal are still visible. And one must visit the Musée de Cluny not that far away to see the heads of the statues of the kings of Judah that were, you may recall, mistaken by vandals for kings of France. The cathedral also served for a time, as many other French churches did during the revolutionary period, as a temple to the goddess reason. And coinciding with Napoleon's concordat with the Catholic Church in the very first years of the 19th century, a restoration which itself coincided with the supreme statement of French Romanticism by François-René de Chateaubriand, Le Génie du Christianisme, the genius of Christianity, the rededicated cathedral was the site of Bonaparte's self-coronation as em emperor, a major act in the drama of emergence of a very specific French concept of the separation of church and state still being refined and contested today. And in the context of the energy of that 19th century Catholic renewal, Victor Hugo's novel of Notre Dame restored the cathedral in the people's minds and hearts, another restoration that was confirmed by the brilliant program of architectural and artistic renewal taken on by the visionary heritage genius, Violet Le Duc. Notre Dame and her fragility today still embodies all of those moments and many more with their deep interweaving of the theological and the locally, nationally, globally, historic, historically situated place. Notre Dame Cathedral stands in its injured splendor as a masterpiece of the Gothic flourishing that as much as anything else earned for France the designation of la fille aînée de l'église, the eldest daughter of the church. An expression that only dates from the 19th century but is based on the much old, earlier fils aîné, the eldest sons of the church reserved for kings in the line of Clovis. The eldest daughter of the church is a formula that I suspect, well, I know very few French people today would sp spontaneously choose to describe whatever their country's identity might be in this identity obsession, uh, identity obsessed second decade of the 21st century. Notre Dame has been exposed since the fire as perhaps never before as the site of persistent theologically grounded meanings equally perennial contestation, atheist or anti-religious or anti-clerical opposition. And perhaps too, this is one of the speculative points of my talk, although you may have to dig through a lot of detail to see it, uh, an atheological suspension of belief, seeking an adequacy relative to the full range of implications of the cathedral today, an ambition that for certain proponents were renewed or rethought laicite, laicity as it's sometimes uh, transliterated, might not be entirely inadequate to the high inheritance and inspiration of Notre Dame. That inheritance and inspiration were brought home so forcefully in the sense of grave collective trauma and loss on the night of the 2019 fire and in the reactions, debates, and decisions that followed and that continue with respect to the rightful place of a once again to be restored cathedral. I am now going to read four quotations from French intellectuals and heritage professionals written in the wake of the fire. And they are, if you have the sheet or are following on the screen, uh, the four liminaries. The first one, every man has a daily appointment with the landscape he inhabits. I live on the Quai by the River Seine, between Saint-Julien-le-Pauvre, where my mother had her funeral, and Saint-Séverin, where Wiesmans was baptized. Notre Dame is there, so near, queen mother of her clutch of churches. I sojourn under the command of Notre Dame's towers. That last piece is a quotation from the poet uh, Piggy, Charles Piggy. Um, second quotation, Notre Dame's spire speaks the language of architecture, one common to all. In its simplicity, it resembles a typographical character. It is its own signifier for lead, its own traffic signal, its own heraldic emblem. Two towers, two pillars that rise from the earth, aspire tense toward heaven, a Martian would understand that. Like the two arms that open up from Bernini's colonnade in Rome, Michelangelo's dome, the grand toothy sprocket that puts the whole gearbox of the heavens and the stars into motion, Notre Dame's spire is what gives the structure its meaning and renders it intelligible. Notre Dame for everyone is an image, only the, only the destruction of the spire had the power to move others in a universal way likely more so even than the irreparable loss of the medieval parts of the Chaffant framework. With the spire, it is the expression of a grand idea that has fallen, much more than the fall of a construction of wood. It was part of those few images which France has given to the world. 
third quotation, there was something beautiful in that catastrophe, as is often, which is to say, too rarely the case with catastrophic, well, pardon me, with catastrophes that leave their mark on the transcendental fabric of human things. And the final quotation from a webinar uh, of science uh, at the bedside of Notre Dame, there are no more stained glass windows, no windows at all. The cathedral is basically empty. There are these holes that are present, but what kept striking us, members of the archeological team, was that the noises on the outside didn't necessarily come inside. We were constantly surprised by that serenity. The first three quotations come from three books published in the wake of the devastating April 2019 fire. The writer alpinist adventurer Sylvain Tesson's impassioned autobio-poetico-theological selection of essays, Notre Dame de Paris, O Reine de Douleur, o Our Lady of Paris, O Queen of Suffering. The art historian and popular novelist Adrien Goethe is more measured and discreetly passionate, patrimonial, mediological, small c, Catholic appraisal of the catastrophe, a work entitled Notre Dame de l'Humanité, Our Lady of Humanity, and Notre Dame des Écrivains, Our Lady of Writers or The Writers, the folio editions, literary anthology, curated with a blazing quickness and intensity of its own by Marc Crépu, a controversial literary critic and writer, currently editor-in-chief of La Nouvelle Revue Française. I will briefly and freely gloss these first uh, liminary quotes in a moment, trying to indicate the many, many threads that I've wanted to try to follow up on while reflecting for more than a year and a half now on the kind and humbling invitation to address such a vast and rich topic my most sincere thanks to Reverend Dr. Tom Curran, Father John Matheson, and to the organizing committee for allowing me this opportunity, and my very warm gratitude to Patricia Chalmers as well, who graciously agreed to respond to the sprawling paper, if we can even call it a paper, paper of papers perhaps, and who also was instrumental in establishing the theme for this extraordinary, coherent, stimulating, and deeply pertinent conference. After my introduction via the four liminary quotes, I will try to regroup and reorganize, pulling some of the threads out, combining them a little roughly, realigning, restitching them into a three-part structure, which will emphasize three aspects of Notre Dame's belonging to and defining of its place. The cathedral and conversions, turnings both physical and metaphysical. The cathedral and relics, how can one and the same thing be both a reliquary and itself a relic? Three, the cathedral in the culture or and the culture, or how to make the cathedral live again. How is it in the era of a culture of the omnipresent image, the generalized screen, and what may be termed an exit from the logos? Can the cathedral speak, mean, attract, persist? Rereading a 1904 text by Marcel Proust with resonance for our context and needs today, will allow us to pose in conclusion the general question of the death of cathedrals and indeed of churches in their places and perhaps that of their resurrection or their afterlife, which is not the same thing, which are not the same things. Each of these three parts could and should be treated more extensively and I beg your indulgence again for as it were trying to fit three papers in one here. It is a function of the richness of the topic which we've seen these past two days. I hope to be just successful enough in this overflowing program to enlighten some aspects of the problematic of this year's Atlantic Theology Conference and to stimulate some reflection and discussion this morning. On the horizon of all of this are the challenges, the mysteries and the discoveries, all of the politics too of the restoration of the cathedral, the actual work of reworking the broken masterpiece, the broken body of the cathedral, the wounded site of awe, sublimity, sacredness, liturgy, that major project, as you know, is already well underway. Le chantier en cours, according to that wonderful French expression, implying a work site, a mission, a purpose, but a contested chantier too in the pluralistic contemporary condition of its place. A construction site or a reconstruction site to evoke a title of a favorite album by Winnipeg's alt rock band, The Weaker Thans, a site with all of its ambivalences, its urgencies, and its transcendent or quasi-transcendent surprises, just hinted at in that last suggestive and beautiful opening quotation from the remarkable soundscape archeologist, Mylène Pardoin. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a soundscape archeologist. What a beautiful, uh, beautiful profession, beautiful métier. 
And I must mention another side of my interpretive matrix here this morning, the personal one, which I've been encouraged to incorporate, and I do somewhat timidly, I approach the topic myself then situated in place, I-M-P-L-A-C-E-D, as well to use a term from the phenomenology of place studies, situated in place as someone who has lived for significant stretches of my adult life under the command of Notre Dame spires very aware of the decentralization and the gravitational pull of that cathedral throughout Paris, Intramuros and beyond, its pull and penetration into the clutch, the brood, the litter of Parisian steeples and parishes, its draw through the innumerable representations, the literary, artistic, historiographical configurations of its place in the city and of the cities taking place with it, around it and about it. I could speak of my regular attendance at saint Severin with its Rouge Chapel and its utterly unique in the Gothic Palmier column of how much I love that congregation and the insights into French Catholicism and into Paris and the experiences of the Vie de Cartier that it afforded me. And if I were in a more extensively openly and less hesitantly autobiographical mode of the deeper work that it did in me or about other Paris churches that really have woven their own commanding attachment from years of regular or occasional contact entre autres, among others, attending the Maronite Rite Masses at saint julien le pauvre with Wayne Hankey and Bruno Neveu in the early 1990s, staggered at times by the blend of ancient chant and tongues in that low, numinous space, or at an Easter vigil, uh, or an Easter vigil of what we might term liturgical tourism in 2004, alternating between the crowd swollen Notre Dame Parvis, or forecourt, and nearby churches on the right and left banks on a beautiful spring night in motion along the Seine with Ralston College's Dr. Stephen Blackwood, so many paschal fires to be seen. Or in a much less exalted and definitely more embarrassing register about how in my first hesitant Paris year with a young theologian classmate, we settled on the dubious decision of literally following, tailing like a couple of bad detectives, our professor of poetry and theology from the Sorbonne after our seminar on the Catholic renewal to see if she would attend mass at Saint Nicolas de Chardonnay, the Antigris Lefebvre's stronghold. I won't say whether she did or did not. I recall profoundly moving funerals at saint Etienne du Mont and saint Sulpice, a Mozart's Requiem concert at Saint-Germain-des-Prés in the midst of a ferocious lightning storm, a self-guided Delacroix safari into the several churches in which his works hang, in various states of care and repair, although their conditions have improved in many cases since, is also a vivid and cherished experience. And Notre Dame, always the mothership, the touchstone, the vertical and horizontal beacon, the wayfinder, literally and in every sense, kilometer zero. It is the origin point for all French, the, the entire French road system and distances are calculated from there. As Marc Pécu put it in his introduction to Notre Dame des Écrivains, qui entre dans Paris, entre dans Notre Dame, qui entre dans Notre Dame, entre dans Paris, un roman, une église. Whomever enters Paris, enters Notre Dame. Whomever enters Notre Dame, enters Paris, a novel, a church. A very simple relation on the face of it then with which to keep beginning city, church, culture in their intertwined dependence upon one another. I want to revisit now the three initial quotations and writers with which we began in order to draw out what each has helped me see in the possible relations of theology and place through the Notre Dame catastrophe and what these short works composed or compiled in the emotional aftermath of the fire, what that makes available for our further questioning and the enlargement of the framework today, uh, thinking ahead to the question of Canadian churches this afternoon. With Tesson, it is a matter of the order of the heart, as he put it in consciously Pascalian echoes, with consciously Pascalian echoes, in a, in a presentation that he did for students and professionals at the Institut National du Patrimoine, the National Heritage Institute. With Goethe, it is a matter of the cathedral as intelligible sign for the culture and for the faith. And with Crépu, it is a matter of the sacramental penetration of the everyday via the very incarnacy of the cathedral and its multi-secular accretion of ecclesiastic, literary, artistic, and political events and signifiers, both famous and anonymous. I'm inclined to point out that these three witness commentators roughly mirror, as Tesson's explicit reference makes clear, 
the Pascalian orders that I will paraphrase here as rational comprehension embodied in felt unity and charitable self-exceeding participation through grace. And all three of them with respect to the destiny of the artistic patrimonial masterpiece, the fate of the meanings and the legacy of European Christianity in a postmodern secularized era, and any possibility of a contemporary renewal of Catholic Christian faith and practice in a time when the organized church struggles. All three of these writers show themselves keenly aware of yet another abyssal Pascalian schematic distinction that between the demi-habile and the habile. Tesson and the Order of the Heart. I'll be returning to the Tesson book again in the context of making a link between the cathedral and contemporary conversion experiences. But let me underline for the moment the centrality of the cathedral to its place as expressed in the first quotation read. It's mothering, networking, commanding, communicating function in a Paris still pockmarked, that's one of Tesson's expressions, with steeples and spires, still transmitting, circulating theological meanings incarnately in and through what Tesson repeatedly calls these vessels, both visibly and invisibly. And vessel, I can't help but adding parenthetically, is a term that is recurrent both in the tradition and in recent attempts to get back into place as a, as a title of Edward Casey's puts it. That is to say, to delineate a place for place relative to the privileging of the categories of time and space in the more dominant currents of modernity. Neil Roberts's paper yesterday has balanced in its demanding articulations and I think is elevated in its aspiration as any cathedral architecture did much to enlighten and to complicate the place space distinction and to show Dante's masterpiece as both the culmination of one worldview and the an announcement of another and at the same time a possible overcoming of the limitations of both and I thank him for that. Uh, in his youth, then, coming back to Tesson, not Neil, uh, when you hear this, you'll, you'll see why. In, in his youth, the author of Notre Dame de Paris, Oren de Douleur, had decided with a few trusted friends that the Gothic steeples pitting the Ile de France would become their very own Alps. And they began to climb the facades and the bell towers of Paris's Gothic masterpieces, moving then further afield. Climbing at night, counter to all good sense and breaking all laws and regulations, driven by the exhilaration of a headlong rush into difficulty, danger, and meaning. They scaled all of the great Gothic monuments north of the Loire Valley and right up into Belgium and Southern Holland. Atop these bell towers and spires and upon these difficult roof lines, they would read alchemical texts and romantic poetry to one another. Tesson, the king of alley cats, as his friends called him, and his band of eccentric climbers delighted in their sublime daring. Poignantly underlining the risks involved, Tesson recounts in the short book, taking two very experienced mountain climbers with him in later years to the top of the 19th century, Violet le Duc Spire of Notre Dame. Both friends were to perish in climbing accidents in the Himalayas within weeks of their visit to the top of the spire. The short essays then in this intensely meditated and lived little volume articulate the group's stegophilia, the love of rooftops. This neologism is the figure of a sublime communion of architecture and place, and is a thread running right through Tesson's reflections, sometimes presented as an experience with an end in itself, sometimes with reference to the destiny of soul, or at times both, as in the following quotation. Absolutely no intellectual claims were made when we climbed. There was nothing situationist in our scaling of these cathedrals, no commandeering of the city for artistic ends, no behavioral surrealism. What interested us in, in Saint-Germain-des-Prés was to climb upon it, not to think upon it below. We would manage barely a quick knowing salute to Dada when we were perched for a laugh in an evening dress upon the peak of a dormer, or maybe another quick hello to Buster Keaton when we would pass as we did coils of rope in our hands in front of the face of a great clock perched high above the city. We climbed because it was beautiful and more useful for our souls than resting our bodies in a bed. End of quotation. And the references to situationism, Dadaism, surrealism, the history of cinema in this uh, brief paragraph remind us how any contemporary evaluation of the cathedral's emplacement or situatedness, that of cathedrals, churches in general, and not to them in particular, must keep alive all of the cultural history uh, in order to function fully as a source of renewed meaning and purpose. Even in their programmatic purposelessness, the contemporary climbers 
have purchased on both the ancientness of the edifice and its intermodal, intertextual rapprochement with modernist and avant-garde displacements, images, and jokes. Tesson, and we will see this in his remarkable use of Notre Dame to turn his broken life around in the 2010s, is also insistent upon how Notre Dame's greatness functions across periods, belief systems, historical paradigms. Notre Dame, he writes, is the cathedral of Christ, but, and then a lyric, lyrical sort of parenthesis, its summit at sunrise, its towers at the setting. It is also a solar temple. The very carnal, visceral, I even want to say adrenal hormonal attachment of Tesson to the Gothic cathedral is a unique contemporary statement of personal and transhistorical attachment, both preciously earthly and pointing beyond the earthbound. There is an inevitable temptation of seeing the fire and its consequences as a sign or portent, and that can lead in quite a few different directions. Um, and it may be read in different ways in our three initial contemporary witnesses. It is a difficult road to go down, but it cannot be ignored. Um, this tendency too is in a way a function of place and it will spill back upon the cathedral and its incarnational and sacramental possibilities. In what other intellectual culture today besides the French one might we find an extravagantly awkward title like de quoi Sarkozy est-il le nom of what is Sarkozy the name or Sarkozy the name of what? Uh, a polemical pamphlet just published just a few years ago by Alain Badiou. Of what is the Notre Dame fire the name would be its correlative here? To what phenomenon does this catastrophe correspond and how to name it? In Tesson's fascinating, forceful, and jittery appearance that I've mentioned at the Institut du Patrimoine, uh, the Institute for Training Curators, Restorers, and Related Heritage Disciplines, Tesson speaks uh, with the title, De quoi l'incendie de Notre Dame de Paris est-il le signe? Of what is the Notre Dame fire the sign? In his short uh, collection of essays, o, o Queen of Suffering, he quotes uh, Leon Blois by way of a response. Oh, how modernity lacks seriousness. Why are we not better conservators? What does this collapse signify? Leon Blois wrote in his journal that God is withdrawing. There is something of this in the image of the fire. Perhaps this epoch did not deserve that spire. It didn't collapse. It slipped away from the carnival. Later, I'll be offering a tentative stab at answering that same question, the, the question of the fire's message using um, uh, the notion of, a, of, of the cultural. Tesson's secularity and his particular slant on French laicity is also worth mentioning and briefly characterizing here since laicite, laicite, secularity, as some prefer, must be a crucial part of our sense of Notre Dame's meaning for the theology of place and for the possible place of theology in Parisian and French terms today. Although even the conversion-like experience that I will relate in a moment had as its focus the physical uh, material edifice of the cathedral, and even though Tesson speaks unequivocally as an admirer and a defender of the immaterial and incalculable Christian heritage of France and of Europe, itself not a perfectly obvious stance today, Sylvain Tesson never allows himself to move to a simple affirmation of or adherence to what he so plainly admires. But he never lets down his critical guard either with respect to uh, tendencies within contemporary secularism that might tend to leave us merely earthbound, incapable of attaining the heights, entering into a communion with all the possibilities visible from the precarious purchase, literal and figurative, of these vessels of meaning. In his latter day neo romantic enthusiasm, he gushes. That is Notre Dame's miracle, too. Christianity has a big heart and its showpiece, the cathedral, willingly accepted to be the shrine of a literary treasure written by a progressive genius. Secularity, laicite, is so much sadder, it refuses all but itself. A good deal of what I will say later, or perhaps will not have quite the time to say later, would, I think, tend to contradict this refusal of contemporary laicite, characterized a bit too hastily, it seems to me, by Tesson as a sadder program, than what Victor Hugo, the progressive genius he refers to, what his genius may have allowed or promised in its 19th century Republican progressivism. With Goethe, uh, we come to the question of the intelligible sign. 
Adrian Goetz is a historian of art and of lit literature and of the reciprocal influence and mutually aware evolution. He's an academic critic and a popularizer whose broad erudition and focus on romanticism and modernity allows him to preface an excellent recent pocket edition of Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris and to write definitively of specialized art historical topics in the 19th century. Unsurprisingly then, he presents us with a meditation on the catastrophe from the point of view of the image and the reading of images. His brief essay, which like Tessons will channel all proceeds from its sales to the charitable foundations for the restoration of the cathedral, begins by recounting his own experience of emerging from an amphi, an amphitheater classroom at the Sorbonne, where he had been lecturing on French revolutionary period art, only to discover news of the fire on his phone and in the rumor and the clamor of the streets, letting himself be drawn down to the banks of the Seine to watch the event and share the emotion of the crowds. What strikes Goetz, apart from the profound shock and sadness of those watching, is the perspective afforded by the smartphones. Every one of us, he writes, during those long hours during which darkness fell and out of which rose the flames ever stronger, each one of us had the cathedral before his or her eyes, but also found it in our pocket. Our, on Twitter, other images appear, all angles, all points of view are there. Goetz provides a telling series of observations of the crowd's relation to the event, so heavily mediated or even overdetermined by the personal technologies available to its members. One of the most memorable anecdotes is when Goetz sees an overexcited young man speaking with some firemen. The one speaking cannot contain his amazement at both the staggering event and the unusual, unprecedented behavior of the crowd. There were more and more people coming. I saw a lot who weren't even filming. Such was the level of their horror. Um, Goetz sets up for us the question of the intelligibility of the sign today, reminding us, if we needed it, reminded that we seem to have come to a point of hermeneutic rupture in our relation to the reading and understanding of this cultural object, but reassuring us too, or trying to, that there have been other analogous moments, citing the renovation of the cathedral undertaken by Louis XI in the late 15th century as one moment where an effort of reinterpretation and rededication had to be undertaken, and he treats at some length the unreadability of the cathedral's portal for Louis de Rusey, Louis the Clever, one of his many nicknames. Unreadability is an interesting notion to be considered as we go along. Um, ceci tuera cela, this will kill that, i.e. the world of the book with the advent of the printing press will kill the world of the physical, built and visible images and meanings of the cathedral. This is one of the most famous and most extensively commented upon quotations from Hugo's vast novel set. It is worth recalling in precisely this uncertain late 15th century and not at the earlier time of what is usually referred to as les bâtisseurs, the builders. The novel reveals perennial concern for the effects of technological transformation, but Goethe does an excellent job in his brief book and elsewhere, helping us see how Hugo never gave in to any such uh, reductionist alternative and how the overcoming of simplistic or seemingly fatalistic choices should be our aim as well. But I do fear um, that in his tentative confidence, based on this dedication to the intelligibility of the sign on his attachment to the cathedral as a masterpiece of both the Middle Ages and the 19th century, a masterpiece of the mélange des genres, the mixing of genres and periods the author of Notre Dame de l'Humanité may underestimate the unprecedented character of certain aspects of the current cultural mutation. Perhaps just sometimes there is something new under the sun. Um, according to Goetz, Victor Hugo's 19th century masterpiece imaginatively proposed the possibility of renewal through its confrontation of older and newer forms of representation and transmission. This sense of transformative possibility in a comparable moment of decline and degradation of sense today allows him to positively reverse and reframe the implications of Hugo's famous statement, ceci tuera cela, and to transform it into a question relative to April 15th. Will this save that? asks Goethe. Hugo won over so many new readers, his book had to be reprinted with great urgency, but the building the thousands of images seen by everyone in the world on the night of the fire may perhaps have been a first restoration of its deep meaning. Gertz takes heart from the inchoate global response to the viral propagation of images of the fire's destruction. 
a response to the shared common image of the cathedral belonging to both high and popular culture to its character as a kind of absolute signifier of something in French or Western European or Western humanity that might be universal or still ever to be universalized. It's promised uniting a particular and universal in a kind of typographic sign, or as he called it in another uh, context, one of Paris's magisterial accents along with the Eiffel Tower and a very few others. A final note on the coming together of patrimonial responsibility and cultural ambition under both the sign of a non-denominational or agnostic human universe universality, Notre Dame de l'Humanité, and that of a particular responsibility of believing and practicing Christians will have to suffice as a last prompt from Adrien Goetz for now. Notre Dame of humanity should first and foremost be, for the Catholic people, Notre Dame of humility, a great intellectual building site, the Chantier Concours. For that, we would need writers, artists, philosophers, Hugo, Lacordaire, Montalembert, Ingres, Flandrin, and of course, Violet Le Duc. This possibility of a renewal of meaning and understanding from within and from without faithful humility is really at the heart of the explorations in the further sections of the paper. Um, I move now to Crépu and his sense of the sacramental character of place. In his preface, one of our three ways into post-April 15th reflections, there is a powerful emphasis on the sacramental character of place. Now, as, as has already been made abundantly clear, I am no theologian, and I find it quite daunting to be presenting among you professionals. I did, however, pursue some modest research over the last year and a half in the discipline on the specific relation of theology to place. And I want to cite the very helpful work, A Christian Theology of Place, which is a 2001 Durham Theology Department PhD thesis available online. The astute recapitulation of so much thought and scholarship and the original insights, to me at least, found in the work of uh, now Dr. John Inga helped situate, inform, and inspire this paper of papers today. And I want to acknowledge his work while at the same time absolving its author of the inevitable inconsistencies and confusions in any adaptation and application of his synthesis and insights by this hesitant dabbler in your field. Um, one quotation will suffice to point the direction of those adaptations and, correct, and connections. This is a quote from the thesis. The incarnation and the particularity of God's relationship with humanity, which flows from it, supports the notion of place, a place remaining of vital significance in God's dealings with humanity, since places can be thought of as the seat of relations or the place of meeting and activity in the interaction between God and the world. How, though, are we to main, maintain a balance between a gospel conviction that Christ has redeemed all places, that he is Lord of space and time, but at the same time, hold on to the importance of the incarnation in inviting us to value place? The best way forward, I shall argue, is to make use of a vitally important component of the Christian tradition and to view place sacramentally. Uh, and I very much appreciated Professor Clavin's opening paper in the conference, which for me, uh, as a kind of beginner in a lot of this, um, prepared uh, a, a deeper setting of that, uh, of that perception that I'm borrowing from John Inga, the uh, author of the Durham PhD thesis. And on this heading, coming back to some of our contemporary uh, French figures, Marc Crépu, uh, is particularly fascinated by a passage in Proust's Recherche, In Search of Lost Time, where the dear family domestic, Françoise, having lived now for many, many years in Paris, admits to never having visited Notre Dame. Ah, comme cela devait être beau, elle qui habitant Paris depuis tant d'années, n'avait jamais eu la curiosité d'aller voir Notre Dame. C'est que Notre Dame faisait précisément partie de Paris, de la ville où se déroulait la vie quotidienne de Françoise. Ah, oh, that must have been beautiful, Françoise, who had then been living in Paris for many a year, had never been curious enough to go see Notre Dame herself. That's because Notre Dame was precisely a part of Paris, part of the city where her daily life unfolded. Marc Cacru pushes this smiling, admiring slash mocking Proustian narrative moment a fair bit further, which is not to say that the implications he draws out would be absent from the text, just that I cannot uh, accompany him further in his reading. He summarizes the daily life of Francoise 
integrated it all, including the transcendental orders, without the need to practice them. It was enough to live in Paris to receive the sacraments. And because I very much want to connect my remarks about Notre Dame and its catastrophe to the Canadian dimensions of our conference focus on burning churches and sacred spaces, I will now open a too long parenthesis to suggest that in our context, the rogue and too often unjustly dismissed experimental writer Scott Simons explored just these questions relative to another Notre Dame, Notre Dame de Montréal, the basilica uh, situated on the Place d'Armes in the heart of old Montreal in his 1967 epo eponymous novel, Place d'Armes. Um, this 1967 novel, Place d'Armes, in a certain light and from a certain angle, might be Canada's hunchback of Notre Dame. But Robert Fulcher did refer to the narrator, narrator, clearly an avatar of Simons himself, as the monster from Toronto in one of the book's first reviews. Quasimodo from Toronto might not be so far off the mark. And in a year when La Sainte Flamelle has eliminated the rival Leafs and maybe on a run to the Stanley Cup, that has a certain ring to it. Um, it is clear that for Simons, it is the radical mixing and exchanging of profane and sacred experience that drives him repeatedly back to La Place, uh, drives his characters with several avatars for himself in the novel, seeking to cite S-I-G-H-T and to cite S-I-T-E, the cathedral and the various other emblematic edifices around the square, Bank of Montreal, which he calls the Mommy Bank, Banque Canadienne Nationale, the first Canadian skyscraper, etc., driving him to cite in both spellings them, perhaps we could say in place them through and in spite of everything that might obscure their meanings, the intelligibility of their signs. Unlike Francoise and Cripu's reading of Proust, Scott Simons and the central character in his multi-tiered book return repeatedly to La Place and to the Basilica. The awareness of the grounding of a sacramental apprehension of life in a particular sacred site is an explicit part of the mission of the author and the fictional emanations of that quest. In a 1972 interview with Graham Gibson published in 11 Canadian novelists, recently re-released uh, by hosts of Anansi Press, Simons put it this way. Well, I would say that anyone who sat down with my three books could have no doubt, uh, no doubt at the end of the three what, I, what it was I was going through. Anybody could see that I was negotiating my way through a series of secular experiences, of blatantly secular experiences, and trying through them to find the spiritual. I was trying to find sacramental reality. And the three books in question, Place d'Armes, Civic Square, which is about an equivalent public square in Toronto, and Heritage, a romantic look at early Canadian furniture, are, it is worth pointing out, all radically place-centric and seeking through all of their artfulness and all of their self-avowed flaws to be decisively place-defining as well. Simon's metafictional anti-novel is both an intensely informed exploration of built heritage in relation and in situ, and a figural return to an inner place, place that can never be fully grasped, but which is always real, imminent in all of life's moments. The cathedral is the source and the locus, but it's also porously related to the city beyond, given giving in a reciprocal exchange of proofs. The final images of the text, a profane monstrance of the host in the square and an outstretched finger bursting with life and blood point there. Staggering from Notre Dame with the host received from the priest in communion in his hand, Hugh Anderson, the main character of one of the book's stacked narratives emerges transformed. He held the host in La Place d'Arme and the rest was irrelevant into the very center and he stood absolutely mobile and saw that the whole place was in dance and that even the mommy bank had budged, that even the beaver on the frontal of the mommy bank was undulant now in this sudden tidal, joke, tidal flow, boring through him, flowing outrageously alive through him to fecundate this entire place while around him as he turned the buildings all vehement in his motion he saw that the people had stopped dead so that he started again to shout look la place d'armes it has come alive for us all of us but still no one moved as he held his host high up over la place so that he knew now that there was only one possible solution and taking the host ate it alive till he embraced and then turning to the first person he could see ran with his right hand outstretched his forefinger out to touch, to give this blood that spurted fresh out the open act as he ran to embrace them in this new life he held out at fingertip to touch they. 
that's how the book ends. Say what you will about Simons, and a lot has been said. That is an amazing finale. How to make revelation out of profanation after having made profanation out of revelation, to borrow a turn of phrase from a French thinker um, to which I will return later. Leaving that Canadian Notre Dame comparison aside now and recentering on what else Crépus short essay makes accessible for us, I'd like to make a final remark about what he refers to as the beauty of the catastrophe, which is really a version of the question, what does the fire mean, posed in so many forms by so many people in the wake of April 15th, 2019. Whether one sees the fire as a warning of our neglect of our past, a punishment for our disregard for the proper preservation of architectural masterworks, an indictment of our contemporary techno distraction or our directionless decadence, or whether one tends to resist, resist such causal discourses, there is a sense in so many observers of a message received. One of the only living French and very likely world architects who have actually designed a cathedral and seen it built uh, the French architect Jean-Michel Wilmot, who designed the new Russian Orthodox Cathedral in Paris, financed by Putin, uh, remarked, what has happened? This drama, Notre Drame de Paris, was a headline in the French newspaper, is almost a sign, almost a sign. This thunderbolt provoked a kind of ecumenical reflection and brought about a French awakening. This almost a sign is turned further in the direction of a saving message by Crépu, one thinks of the oxymoric neologism, e catastrophe, coined, I think, by J.R.R. Tolkien. E catastrophe, a happy catastrophe, perhaps. Hmm? Considering conversion, relics, and the place of the cathedral in a mixed um, se secular culture will allow us to better assess Kripke's euphoric effusions. The cathedral and, confer and conversions then. Notre Dame, seen as Notre Dame des Écrivains, has been the site of the noteworthy conversions of a number of literary and cultural figures. Very likely the most famous was that of the poet, dramatist, essayist, diplomat, Paul Claudel, who had a total illumination. He was reading Rambo at the time and a radical change of heart while in attendance at Vespers on Christmas day, 1886. Seated next to the second column on the right, as he put it in his memoir, Ma Conversion from 1990, 1909, sorry, the thunder struck there. For many Claudelians, that spot is a place of pilgrimage within or in addition to the many other sorts of pilgrimage that might bring one to Notre Dame. There have been other conversions in situ and many, many other writers have borne witness to the cathedral's cumulative meanings and mysteries and transformations in a range of modes and genres, which the anthology uh, admirably contains. I do want to talk about one specific contemporary conversion experience that is directly related to Notre Dame and then situate it for thicker context relative to some other French and current French literary work that puts forward possibilities of conversion. The role of churches, sacred places and spaces, central in all of these examples that I've chosen, will give some unity to this necessarily over-condensed approach to what seems to be a real and significant phenomenon in today's French literary culture. I've already told you about Sylvain Tesson's youthful climbing of Notre Dame. The king of alley cats went on to have a unique career as a writer, traveler, adventurer, one that most recently has seen him climbing previously unscaled coastal rock faces with Greek guides this spring in commemoration of Byron's role at Missolonghi and writing a, ref a reflection on the meanings of the Greek War of Independence for Europe today. We could also mention his retracing the Gulag escapees route from Russia into India, simply to prove against skeptics that it could be done, or the winter he spent alone in a cabin in the wildest wilds of Siberia, or a season spent stalking the snow leopard in the Himalayas with one of the world's great wildlife photographers. The list of his books and adventures is long. The personal story of what he will call his conversion through Notre Dame is best begun by the writer himself, who starts his tale by citing a kind of numb indifference to his Parisian home and surroundings, perhaps the result of too much demanding exotic travel, or what some have also called the paradox of ambient immersion. Tesson launches abruptly into his story like this. It would take an accident for me to pay heed to what was available to me. The year had been rough. Difficulties had befallen my family. Sometimes I wondered what we had done to the gods. Then my mother died and I fell from a window. I'm not sure how it happened. I woke up in pieces in a hospital bed. 
and I had to spend nearly four months lying flat in a support corset. Advanced medicine, the solicitude of the nurses of the Pitié Hospital, that word, pity, is not dangerous. The love of those close to me, the saintliness of a dear one, the reading of good novels, all of that would save me. And I picked myself back up, able to walk. My carcass had to be remuscled and the doctors were all advising exercise, therapy, re-education, as we say in French, re-education, they said. I didn't like that word. It made me think of the methods of the Soviet Politburo. The idea of spending hours upon hours in a room of exercise equipment was demoralizing. It dawned on me that at a cable's throw from my apartment, there was the cathedral. The vessel of stone was there, becalmed on the island. I only had to climb to the top of its towers to find my strength again. And what follows in this amaz amazing second essay <clears throat> of Notre Dame de Paris entitled Our Lady of Good Comfort is his account of this re-education process. His dismay at his extensive injuries and the fear that they inspire, his sense of humiliation when in his laborious progress up the stairs of the Notre Dame Towers, he holds up hordes of eager tourists. His self-consciousness about his facial paralysis, the result of the 10 meter fall from the facade of a writer friend's chalet in the Alps, quite likely inebriated at the time if one reads between the lines. All of this reduced Tesson to a vulnerable, seeking, radically attentive patient of his own program of re-education and rebirth. I had spent my life chasing down mountains in pure expenditure with no calculation. And here I was at 42 years of age, struggling just to make it up a staircase, a life on the road, vagabonding, only to end up like this. I felt horribly melancholic. I will forever consider those sets of stairs as the most radical expression of destiny's sanctions. Every step sounded the call. One must not dispose too lightly of one's life. After months of this regimen, Tasson comes again into a kind of communion with the cathedral. His earlier years of intimate acquaintance with the materiality of the Gothic, his familiarity with the principles of its channeling of forces, a knowledge worthy in its own way of a panoply, came back to him. Less so now in the former mode of lyrical effusion, like a Gothic church is an ener energy acc accelerator or a spire is a geyser of mineral sap. Um, then in the mode of a chastened but hardened and empowered acolyte. His healing brings a different attitude, not that of the agile, fearless stagophile, but that of someone humbled in search of an understanding of destiny, both personal and civilizational, through contact with the deep realities of the cathedral. Every day, I felt my strength returning. There was something alchemical in those hours of exercise, as though the mystery, the power of Notre Dame, was pulsing through my flesh. Now I am recovered. I walk straight, and I always salute the towers of Notre Dame when I wander at their feet. I recognize and render unto them in these modest lines the benefaction they offered to me. This symbolic salute, the mutual saving greeting of Notre Dame, functions both to anchor him to his place more lovingly than ever before and to strengthen him for renewed action in the wider world. And when his lady of good comfort, Bon Secours, burns that April night, Tassant reacts with an immediate text of devotion included in the brief sample of writings to which I've referred all along. He says of the fire, the third text was written the night of the pyre. It is a declaration of love to the white lady and it is the avowal of my conversion. Not that I have been visited by the grace of faith since the fire, but I believe more than ever and more than yesterday when the coals had not yet been lit in the chance for France to be a Christian daughter. I will no longer mess about upon the roofs of churches. Presently, misbelievers, my type, must instead push open the church doors, advance beneath the vault, the vaults, and tell themselves this. Even if heaven is empty, it is good that men invented this religion more luminous than the others. Notre Dame is not vindictive, and she does not discriminate, for she is not secular. May the smile of the good virgin continue to watch over those who believe in her and over those who do not. If her smile came to fade, came to be effaced, what would we have to offer in its place? Grimaces of marmosets, minor primates on the forecourt. But satisfaction with oneself does not a civilization make. What we may call uh, Tesson's conversion without conversion leaves him, ever the intrepid climber, poised between his constructed version of laicite, something of a straw man perhaps, and his affirmation of religion's valid and vital legacy and its place in the contemporary world. The smile of the Virgin to which Tesson commits 
harkens back to what Professor Robertson had to say yesterday about Notre Dame's role, Notre Dame Mary's role in the transhumanizing of virtues in the transition to the most divinized state's soul. I could not help but think of Tesson when he was speaking about that. Destruction was his Beatrice, to misquote Madame May somewhat, but Notre Dame, the church, and the lady behind the church, in her comfort and care, lifts him higher, though still resolutely poised outside of the church, still you might say climbing, clinging to it. The submission of faith does not come to Tesson, but he is vigilant with respect to what he considers to be the fundamental things. And keep this in mind later, uh, and particularly this notion of effacement, um, which I think is very uh, important for reading the sign of a possible rest restored um, cathedral. I'm definitely going to be lacking time. So I'm going to tell you that I was going to talk about um, the uh, conversion and failed conversion really experiences in Michel Welbeck, who's a very controversial French author, probably one of the most famous uh, contemporary novelists in the world right now. Um, I will simply say that it's possible to draw together a number of failed conversions in Welbeck with a number of historical precedents, in particular, the figure of Usmans, who I've mentioned three or four times, who was a late 19th century decadent, who in his own life and through his novels proposed um, a repentance and a conversion very much relative to sacred sites. And in, uh, in a novel of uh, Welbeck's entitled Submission, where in the end, the main character converts to Islam, uh, he first goes through a kind of effortful, almost parodic repetition of Riesmann's uh, gestures before finally figuring out he cannot make the move that the 19th century decadent made. Um, and it's fascinatingly drawn out through uh, the connection to uh, churches, chapels, and, uh, and various cathedrals in France. I'll have to leave that out. I did want to quote, though, from something quite lovely that's appeared this year. Um, from the derisive assertion of the impossibility of conversion, one expressed, I think, with real regret by Welbeck, we can move to a different, more affirmative narration of conversion's unavoidab or unavoidability for at least some uh, thinking hearts today, as expressed in the work of Sébastien Lapac. Lapac's Ce monde est tellement beau, This World is so beautiful, Act Sud 2021, is a novel praised by the literary critic Vincent Jory as follows. Let us give thanks to Lapac for this bursting erudite book, one that chases after light. Indeed, in this novel, composed in three parts, a sort of rereading of the Divine Comedy. Once we get through the first part, entitled Le Monde, which is the real translation channel, the challenge, I'll just say filth world, for lack of something better right now. Le Monde, and then in Purgatory and Paradise, everything gets bathed in a warm light, gentle and discreet. A goodness runs through each one of the multiple characters that the protagonist encounters. It's unreal. Even the most truly sorted of them are spared. Lepak has got it all figured out. One should always go counter to one's time. The astonishment of the reader can only be total. At a time when dominant figures in the French novel never cease trailing their feet through excrement, a book about the beauty of the world can only delight. And I'm going to quote one of a number of set pieces, which are tend to be happening at mealtime. It is France, after all. Dinner colloquies in Versailles um, with uh, a remarkable family, the Kildea family, a retired teacher and his wife, Anne, uh, a speech therapist, Walter, the teacher, and his wife, Anne, and their dear friend, a singular Lacanian priest. That would be pretty singular. Père Ragonès. They are discussing the possibility of the main character and narrator's return to faith. Lazar, yes, it's pretty explicit. Lazarus is seeking some kind of guarantee, a sound reasoning that will confirm that he is truly ready to make that turn, an argument that might allow him to commit to it fully. Father Reganes enjoys him, enjoins him to ease up on himself in this progression. Just be a little bit superficial in this business. That will save you. A silence fell which doesn't mean that we are enemies of reason. At that instant, Anne Kildea's voice moved me. I gazed at her. She preferred discretion, but she knew what speaking can mean. The grandeur and misery of words, that was her job. That night, I really had to force myself to bring up with my friends the shiver that had run down my spine 
on the occasion of mass on the first Sunday in Lent at the Shark Cathedral. And I was almost regretting it. They had made fun of me, taking me for a worked up aesthetic, sniveling for the threatened heritage of Christianity, stained glass, monstrances, missiles, bells, Sundays, picturesque nuns, confessionals. The celebration of the Catholic heritage and of a certain religiosity persistent beneath the boot of hedonism was in fashion for the France of the first decades of the 21st century. Was I still at that stage myself? Lazar's path to conversion will lead him again, inevitably, to the cathedral, the one in Chartres, as it happens. But I think neither Le Pac in this novel nor I really want to take the Chartres, Notre Dame de Paris binary too seriously, in spite of Riesmann's and others' eloquence on the subject. The really crucial movements of the novel's representation of a contemporary conversion are worked out in community in a small world in the Normandy countryside, one founded through simple force of character and passion by Xavier Cudea, the lumberjack peasant brother of Lazar's Versailles teacher friend. Those developments have everything to do with understanding and respect for nature's rhythms and truths, with working together in the long-term management of forests, learning from their revelations, with the experience of simple, beautiful liturgy in marginal, persistent monastic settings, all of it well outside of mainstream culture. Ultimately, it is an ecological Lodato C kind of conversion, not a conversion from within a self-recognized framework of late modern or extreme contemporary decadence, that possibility established so well by Welbeck, but which that author's characters never quite attain. So Tesson, Welbeck, and Lapac, even though I've only really spoken about two of them, are just three examples of what appear to be a growing number of recent writings which pose conversion in some form as an option, and which to a significant extent articulate the possibility the failure or the achievement of such a turn in relation to religious buildings, either with explicit and learned reference to canonical precedents like Wiesmann's or in less programmatic or at least less overtly intertextual fashion as in the emergence of this Lazar character, Lapac's everyman teacher, Lazar, his emergence into the beauty of a reality that to echo Petru or Simons has become sacramental. I'm going to move on to the relics and I'm going to be shortening my last two sections in view of the passing time while trying to get some of the key points uh, across. Um, the cathedral and relics. Reading and rereading those essays by Tesson and Goertz, I was struck by their deployment of the notion of relics. We know that before the fire, Notre Dame de Paris contained officially recognized authenticated precious relics. Fragments of the crown of thorns, Saint Louis' tunic, bones, pieces of, of a number of other saints' remains, including Saint Genevieve, the patroness of Paris. And we know that almost all were saved through the quick action of firefighters, with some bystanders assisting in a human chain. I haven't looked at this very closely, but it is a fascinating aspect of that remarkable night of April 15. And we may have noticed that many objects and works that would not qualify as relics under a traditional canonical church or dictionary definition of the word were nonetheless characterized as such in the media. Everything from the 19th century statuary created for the Violet le Duc restoration to the cathedral's marvelous bells from the Mace, part of a remarkable series of paintings that the guilds of Paris presented every year to the cathedral. Uh, from all of that to some of the more and less ancient furniture all of these works and objects were characterized as relics of the cathedral and their rescue in the moment or their fortunate absence from the cathedral because of the ongoing repair and restoration work that actually led to the fire. These were all often qualified by journalists and commentators as miraculous. This semantic slippage of the term relics in the general conversation, I think is revealing and it serves a certain interpretation of what we might, where we might be today with respect to relics. Um, let's listen to Goertz and Tesson again before, to get a little, before trying to get a little more deeply into that. Adrien Goertz, the wood framing of the roof, the chaton, was original, which might be stupefying, might seem stupefying, except for that part which framed the spire and the aisles were worked in the 19th century restoration. It was a hidden treasure, an invisible relic of the Middle Ages, a relic of incontestable authenticity that no one could see, very precious, very fragile. The spire was just the opposite. The whole world could recognize it, covered in lead, ornamented with copper statues. The ultimate spire and the relic of ancient times have now forever disappeared together. But isn't the entire work of art now a reliquary with no relics, 
the form of which lives on and might itself alone accomplish miracles. I take it that Goetz wants to do three things here. First, emphasize the law, that the loss from the fire <clears throat> has both visible and invisible aspects. Something that no one ever saw is lamented, right? The Chapant. Uh, underline the complementarity of the secret and the apparent, the rare and the common in the ongoing meanings and the perhaps still intelligible sign of the damaged cathedral. And thirdly, to play on the subtractive paradox of a, a reliquary with no relics in order to stimulate imagination, efficacy, restoration, improbable, miraculous faith in a carrying forward a possible transmission. Sylvain Tasson now, and a mild language warning here applies. I was worried about having to read some of the Welbeck quotes, so it's just as well I got to skip that. They're quite, uh, quite dramatically profane. Um, uh, Tasson doesn't hold back too much either. After all, he writes, a certain way of thinking in Western Europe ships with a passion upon the mantic virtues of the Blessed Virgin. The dynamiters of the past deny the spiritual roots of Europe, look with suspicion upon the old faith, criticize a certain vision of the world, and occupies themselves with causing the virtues to disappear. Why, given all of that, would they cry at the collapse of a monument that is precisely the reliquary made stone of the spirit that they hate? Sure, they will legitimize their tears by their lamentation of a patrimonial heritage catastrophe, but Notre Dame is not a monument, it is a church and the limestone incarnation of the word. It's interesting that Tesson, the stubborn atheist, is always crusty. He's more than a little reactionary at times, but his polemic contains some really helpful language that we might also use in a more measured way. The reliquary of the spirit and the limestone incarnation of the word are two antonymic propositions, perhaps even double, doubly antithetical ones, but definitely uh, mutually reinforcing ones um, that begin to approach the level of attention to complexity and paradox necessary to get at the cathedral as both a reliquary and itself a relic, presenting itself post-catastrophe as a damaged body or the rent fabric of signification, but also as a vessel, a shrine, a container of meanings that have been at least temporarily stripped away must be reinvested, rededicated, perhaps in the same sense as the rededication of the church with all of the problems inherent in all of those re-prefixes. My guide in this, as some of you will be expecting, is the poet philosopher Michel Duguy, who has elaborated what I think is the most nuanced and extensive generalization of the figure of relics <clears throat> for our contemporary condition. If anyone knows of any other figures working in a serious and original way on this notion, please bring them to my attention. Michel de Guy received an honorary doctorate in 2016 from the University of King's College and his A Theological Address in the King's Chapel at the baccalaureate service was a challenging one. And I'm very grateful um, to Tom Curran again and to Gary Thorne for their um, assistance in making that event happen and their responses in the uh, special issue of Dow French Studies that we produced to remember, commemorate that occasion. Um, I'm going to self plagiarize here for a moment and go through a short section of the introduction to this work of De Guise that I translated, uh, A Man of Little Faith, and I'm the Peu de Foi, um, to give you some of the key uh, language of this conception of uh, precious relics. Uh, and I'll summarize that a little bit, and then I think I'll move to a kind of a concluding summary of my, my last section. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, an extract from the introduction to the 2014 volume. In the Guy, we find a powerful theory of tradition and transmission. It's articulated in a man of little faith through a metaphorical language of sacred relics, a language that's a further development and a new take on what are for him longstanding reflections on profanation and revelation. The master term underlying all of this is a characteristically De Guyan double negation, in effacement, in effacement. The section of a man of little faith, which precedes the first ever occurrence in De Guy's corpus of the expression, the precious, precious relics, we find this passage. How can we make ineffaceable that which has become unbelievable? That is the function of literature, one of the modes of the Hegelian overcoming, Ufhebung, coming in relief or in lost preservation. That is metamorphosis, 
literature reemployed mythologemes and theologemes. William Blake and Northrop Fry said the great code. The term ineffaceable, ineffaceable refers to a line of thinking begun more than a decade before um, in Arrêt Fréquent, Frequent Stops from 1991, one of the Jews' witty and revealing titles gleaned from the semiology of the contemporary city. Check out the Canada Post van the next time you're behind one. It's, it's an ars poetica, huh? frequent stops. Uh, it's a found profane uh, object awaiting revelatory uh, activation through condensation here in the title um, as an apoetic, a poetic art. Uh, in the numerous verbal conceptual variations of the term in the pages of Ari Freikon and elsewhere, we also find the possibility or we might, what we might even call the infrastructural necessity of the relics um, and their latent possibility is born by the of for years before they emerge explicitly in this 2003 volume. How to make revelation with profanation after having made profanation with revelation? The question is simple, but doubled up and it redoubles in intensity through one of those abyssal twists that De Guy likes so much. In Ari Fréquent is the question of all that has been profaned corresponding to the ravages of what he calls the cultural culture. What is sought by the poet thinker is another kind of profanation, run in counter to reductive totalization, one that might pre preserve and reactivate the full richness of imaginative language of the general fable as expressed in theologies and mythologies, and as taken up in poems in the broadest extension of that term. Literature and its thought, poetics, can entertain the ambition of a second enchantment, which is not that of simple return, to re reiterate a fundamental trait of De Guy's argument and sensibility. Sans retour, one of his titles, no return is a title which admits no appeal. Hmm? The second enchantment, the metaphysical change evoked by De Guy is rather a promise of a promised land, according to one expression that the author used a good deal when he was elaborating his theories of the cultural and of the sublime, and which persists in current modulations around relics and very interesting connection around ecology and ecologics as well. So uh, I'm going to isolate and pose for your consideration three aspects of this overall thinking of relics that I think can help us with conceptualizing the post-catastrophe cathedral, characterize itself as a relic in the complex senses proposed by both Tesson and Goethe. Firstly is this operation of ineffacement. In order for the cathedral to be intelligible sign again, in the wake of its near loss, what has become unbelievable must be ineffaced, brought back to intelligibility through the active program of a thinking poetics for today's society. Secondly, the striking turn of phrase, how to make revelation out of profanation after having made profanation out of revelation can clarify the two levels of necessary uh, for restoration of the cathedral within the context of laicity. Both Goethe's humility and Tesson's militancy are needed. Thirdly, a restored relation to the cathedral could benefit from the notion of a second enchantment achieved through a renewal and a redeployment of the figures of theology and sacred story or myth from both inside the faith community and by those adjacent to it. Such a thinking of relics would inform political aesthetic questions like rebuilding identically versus opting for a gesture of contemporary creativity or what balance ought to be struck between the church taking charge of its own restored precious place and its safeguarded relics and the state's culturalization of the extraordinary artistic and arch architectural legacy of the cathedral. President Macron's bold affirmation, his guarantee really, that the cathedral will be open in time for the Paris Olympics in 2024 is a perfect illustration of the risks of this kind of culturalization of the cathedral. And a pertinent example of a work running counter to this would be De Guy's own poem, En sortant de Saint Pierre de Rome, On My Way Out of Saint Peter's in Rome, a text where the Pieta of Michelangelo is poetically relayed outside the church, brought into metonymic association with a homeless rag picker in a Baudelairean hymn of pity and piety, which gives an idea what the activation of relics by contemporary art could be like. And so here, deeply into your patient listening, I'm basically telling you I need a class, a whole course to get to all of this. Um, 
I'm going to conclude, sadly, not by going through the Proustian essay, um, which I commend to you, uh, but simply uh, by reading my last three paragraphs, which I think can let you see what he's done in his essay, The Death of Cathedrals from 1904. Our situation is really Proust's thought experiment. This, Proust imagines a world where there is no Christianity. Catholicism has died out in France, but we have these relics, the, the cathedrals. Our situation is in many ways, Proust's thought experiment stood on its head. While there has been no complete abandonment of Catholicism, its level of practice in French society is a fraction of what it once was. Vatican II changed the very rights that Proust saw as, a foundation, as foundational to his beloved cathedral's living continuity. That being said, the recovery which the present situation demands is most certainly not that of practices to be reconstituted from scholarly research, uh, but instead the restoration of the damaged vessel itself, physically damaged by the catastrophe of fire, diminished in its prestige and signifying power by the neglect of the country and its state, which like Tesson before his own accident had ceased to see what lay right before it, a vessel quite literally obscured by the phenomenon of mass tourism, which screens the cathedral, even as it displays it with parked tour buses, at least as much a part of our visual experience of the church some days as the millinery marvel of flying buttresses, effaced perhaps most of all by the creeping cultural forgetfulness of which the loss of the ability to name and articulate the elements of Notre Dame the inability to read a church would be the most basic sign. How can the cathedral be ineffaced? How to turn its profanation back to revelation? I want to conclude by citing Adrian Goetz again. He is attentive to the theoretical and practical dimensions of building back better uh, to risk that at once insipid and promising uh, phrase of today in the service of thinking a restoration. He writes, it remains for us to teach those who trembled and cried on April 15th what a cathedral is, what it's for, and how it is the result of an accumulation of events, of enrichments, of destructions and restorations that have made it a living work of art, the keys to which faith can give. When thinking about the future of damage not to them, and perhaps this statement is generalizable beyond the case of just that beloved exemplary Paris cathedral to all fragile damaged or precarious churches. I'm definitely thinking of possible intersections with this afternoon's talk by Susan Harris, which I'm looking forward to very much. We are in a situation where erudition, archeology, span reading, interpretation, teaching are required. All of these in a renewed and restored humility of the catastrophized faithful, but also very importantly, from the side of the impious piety of palinodic dis or misbelief with its aspiration too to hold Notre Dame ever at the center of the city and to be held by her. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Elson has made it clear there's another advantage to living in Halifax, which is that you can attend his seminar, which we've had a preview with at least 13 to 26 sessions. Uh, uh, in order to give people a, a brief moment before we have the response, uh, we will resume the uh, presentation by Patricia Chalmers at 11.35, 35 minutes after the hour, except of course in Newfoundland. Uh, so, uh, Please bear in mind that in the afternoon session today, there will be uh, an opportunity again for questions. So anything that uh, can't be dealt with this morning could very well be uh, subject to uh, a response from any of the speakers this afternoon in our final session. It's Ms. Patricia Chalmers that we now welcome. She is a native of Winnipeg, but is another loyal Nova Scotian whom I first met at the University of King's College when Patricia was a student in the King's Foundation Year program. And my impression is that two things can be said about her early formation at this stage in her life. I do not believe that Patricia has ever abandoned either the literature or the world of ideas 
that Patricia encountered during those years, nor has Patricia ever abandoned the friendships that she established in those same years. And Patricia is another correspondent of graduate studies at Dalhousie University in classics. After several years working at the Halifax Memorial Library, Patricia moved to Philadelphia, where she was awarded a Master of Science from Drexel University's College of Information Studies. Following a one-year internship as a manuscripts cataloger in the rare book department of the Free Library of Philadelphia, she returned, uh, she went on to a one-year internship as a manuscripts cataloger and became an assistant librarian at the University of King's College in 1990 and was privileged to be part of the planning for the college's award-winning new library designed by Roy Woolworth. It is in the King's Library where Patricia can be found day in and day out, helping out people, always ready to help people like me find obscure articles or volumes, and even more importantly, helping teachers, some of whom are here, after learning what their interests are, then offering insights, suggestions, allusions, which allow the subject under consideration to receive more context, more detail, and more authority than would have been the case had we not had the insight and opportunity to consult her. So thank you very much. I speak for myself there. Philadelphia's rare book department became a lifelong interest in irreplaceable manuscripts and printed texts, irreplaceable like Notre Dame, and this uh, supports and is supported by her devotion to the built heritage of Nova Scotia. The recreations include bookbinding, botany, and bird watching, and helping all King's academics. Patricia. Thank you very much, Tom. I've been praised several times for uh, proposing the theme for this conference. And I would like to take this opportunity that thanks should also be extended to Elizabeth Shepherd, with whom I have on several occasions discussed this idea of investigating the idea of, a, of why we are so attached to church buildings. And we've often um, shared the thought that well, in my case, at least I'm more historically inclined. We would like to have people who are philosophers or theologians to explore that idea and help illuminate it for us. So in, um, in, in, in reflecting on the, the theme of this conference, I, I would like to include Elizabeth Shepherd as one who had also thought about this and with whom, and who had said, we should, we should ask people to talk about these things. So I would like to thank the members of the organizing committee for developing the theme for this conference and affording me an opportunity to contribute. My thanks also to Professor Christopher Elson for his thoughtful and intriguing paper. I feel that we have sat before a vast banquet with so many dishes before us. It's difficult to know which one to, to approach. It seems to me that the burning of Notre Dame like the attack on the Twin Towers and the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, has become one of those moments about which we ask one another, where were you when you heard the news? I was in the King's College Library when Sam Landry came to the desk and told me, eyes wide in awe, that Notre Dame was burning. I could not quite believe what he said. And at first I thought he meant some other Notre Dame, the university perhaps, or Notre Dame de Montréal. But he assured me that it was indeed the great stone Gothic cathedral at the heart of Paris, which was on fire. And video, footage, video coverage was streaming live on the internet. I felt a sense of shock that this great achievement of the Middle Ages, this vast and storied eminence, the first medieval building which I had ever seen and then entered 
Indeed, the first great church or cathedral of which I have any recollection was threatened with destruction. And I felt sorrow and loss. As the afternoon went on and social media spread those appalling images of the conflagration, a number of students shared their dismay at the terrible news. I began to engage them then and in the following days, asking if there was a building in Canada or in Nova Scotia or their home province for which they would feel a comparable sense of loss. This question gave them pause. Several students, mostly from Ontario, suggested the Parliament buildings in Ottawa. One suggested the CN Tower. A student from Guelph mentioned, almost as an afterthought, the Basilica there. More than a few said that they would be heartbroken if the King's College buildings would be to, were to be destroyed. Particularly, said one, our beautiful library. But most said that they felt more attachment to natural landscapes. There had been terrible forest fires in California the year before, and several students spoke of how they would feel if Kitchen Pujik National Park were to burn, or the Cape Breton Highlands, or Algonquin. Haley Frail from Caledonia, Queens County, reiterated the sense that natural places meant more to Canadians than built ones. Caledonia is surrounded by rivers and forests and the traditional occupations of lumbering, mining, hunting, fishing, and wilderness guiding have been the historical mainstay of the community. A fire in Keji and its environs would indeed be devastating. It is so central to their lives. Knowing, however, that Haley was a student of history who had worked in the summer at the local museum, I pressed the point. Were there no old buildings in her village, a particularly interesting house or a church whose loss would hurt? But Haley replied that at least in rural Nova Scotia, they are so used to seeing the old place go because people couldn't make a go of it or moved away or whatever. In her community, people would not now fight to save a church that was closing because they had been accustomed to withdrawal and neglect. That struck me as an expression of resignation and despair. I hope that this afternoon's paper will give us an opportunity to reflect more on the losses in Nova Scotia. But I turn back now to Notre Dame de Paris and the response to the catastrophe. Professor Elson's paper reminds me of the cathedral itself and its triple focus on three liminaries, three witness commentators, inspiring three aspects, each woven from many threads. It recalls those three great rose windows whose medallions are arranged in concentric circles, radiating around the center. However, if I confess that I found some of the tangents to be like the statues around the high altar, which distract a little from the central focus, I hope I will be forgiven. From amongst so varied an offering of ideas, illusions, themes, suggestions, I can only touch on a little, and I would like to recall the idea of an important building being central to its place. Notre Dame is a commanding presence in a city endowed with many famous structures. And as Sylvain Tesson writes, Notre Dame is there, so near, queen mother of her clutch of churches. This attachment to a building, this recognition of its centrality, leaves one with a hollowness, a sense of absence if disaster strikes. This reminded me of a reflection which I read the morning after the fire by an anonymous Englishwoman living in Paris. And she echoes in a way the quotation which you gave us from Proust, referring to Francoise. And in the interest of time and brevity, I shall leave you with this quotation. It's my experience that Parisians don't often go inside all the famous sites, except when we're showing guests around. Parisian school children visit them, the same as other tourists, 
because they don't go otherwise. On the other hand, we do ride past them on the bus and think it's still there. Or more precisely in French, referring to Notre Dame or the Eiffel Tower, elle est toujours là, which I feel might be better be translated, she's still there, with a definite bit of a personification going on. Paris is a relatively small city in terms of the space it occupies, which means you are going past famous landmarks all the time. As soon as you cross the river, you can see the Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame, the Musée d'Orsay, Concorde, the Louvre. My feelings today are that Parisians are above all sad, relieved that it wasn't worse, and in a state of disbelief at the idea that we might have crossed over the river looked along to the Ile de la Cité and seen that she wasn't there anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia, for giving us that insight into what inspired this conference and the issues that we seek to address as loyal Nova Scotians and Prince Edward Islanders, members of the Maritimes in relation to our beloved structures and buildings. Thank you for putting that idea central to our minds, which is of course the key issue that we will be addressing this afternoon. Uh, is there, first of all, let me begin by asking, is there a question here from anyone present? Okay, good, they're clear, great. Uh, there are some rather long points here, so I think I have to move. Um, so yes, uh, from John and Christine Rye, I can assure you that everything that has been said by Dr. Elson and everything is it being expunged by Dr. Elson from his own talk will be published in the conference proceedings and that uh, all references and quotations will be fully exercised there. Uh, but from the same couple, John and Christine, I read, is there any connection between the mental images of Notre Dame and the failure of the Anglican Old Catholic Church to connect in the Francophone world compared to the Portuguese Spanish speaking world? I'm assuming Dr. Elson will not be answering that question, but there are some experts here. Uh, Father Harris, for instance, would you have any? Well, all right, in that case to say something concrete, my brother is the uh, Church of England chaplain in Vienna, and he has decades of experience working together with the old Catholics. Uh, the name of the church is Christ Church Vienna. We can uh, provide more information, but even that would provide uh, the rise with the an answer they need because uh, of his lifelong uh, devotion and work together with them. Uh, Guy Livingston says, I think a friend of yours, bravo, Dr. Elson, extraordinary lecture. Uh, here we have from Ms. Hall Beyer. I think of the polarity in Paris since the 19th century of Sacre-Cœur and Notre Dame, one low and reaching up, one high and overlooking, one from the age of faith, one from the age of ultramontanism, which is again, the old Catholics appearing and so on. What might public reaction have been if Sacre Coeur had been burned? Can that thought experiment open any doors into the im placement? These are imaginative questions. Um, I love the way that the, uh, the questioner, uh, Marika hall Bayer, put that, um, the kind of uh, different approaches to the landforms, something I hadn't given any thought to as I was thinking about this uh, 
intercommunication of the churches with, as uh, as uh, Tesson put it, you know, Notre Dame as the as the mothership or the uh, the, the queen mother of the clutch of churches. Um, I think the reaction would have been very similar, but quite likely, you know, it has partly to do, I think, with the with the neighborhood surrounding um, uh, Montparnasse, has partly to do with the Parnassian character, which I think is played out in everything from all of the modernist cabarets that grew up in that area right through the very kind of banal tourist art that is just so abundant there. Um, I think I think that there would have been a sense of a colorful side of Paris that was wounded or perhaps destroyed versus the most deeply rooted form that the church and its meanings still have um, in that way that Patricia mentioned where you know she's still there she's still standing I feel that the reaction would have been mourning shock um, and a whole lot of associated fears for the neighborhood but you would not have had quite that sense of the priority uh, and the rootedness of that church its integral relation to all the others um, and 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 to the roots of the of the of the church in Paris. That's a pretty inadequate answer, but thank you for the very thought provoking question. And um, there's a question here from someone named Sue Zink. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, for, for Patricia, thank you for your thoughtful response and proposing the theme of this Atlantic Theological Conference. I think this is directed to you. During your discussion with the students, did any speak to what interval space, the internal space, the Notre Dame occupied within them? How would you characterize the affinity between the sacred building and the still small voice within? My conversations with the students were usually brief ones, um, seized in brief moments in, in the library, at the front desk, or in the quad. So I can't speak for their, the depth of their, their feeling and, and, and uh, particular spiritual sense of loss. Thank you. Thank you. So how would you characterize the affinity? Well, I would have to say that the building isn't necessary for listening to, to the still small voice within any more than being in a particular natural place is necessary. But I think that both provide opportunities to listen better, to uh, be able to focus one's attention and enforce a feeling of being receptive to what is before you. And I think the architecture of churches um, and indeed the liturgy are, are thought out and presented to us in a way to help enforce our attentiveness. Um, As, as George Grant says somewhere, the faculty of attention, which is even our freedom, the places and events which help to help us to pay attention um, are to be cultivated and preserved. On a, on a personal note, I'd just like to say that Patricia is a frequent face that is seen here at St. George's. So I assume that the reconstruction of St. George's has been a significant part of your own life, which you've witnessed and overcome. And in Nova Scotia, we also had a architectural jewel, St. John's Lunenburg, 
burned down. And uh, it appeared uh, at the beginning of a lecture we had in our lecture hall and students uh, understood that it was an architectural jewel for Nova Scotia. And even though many of them will never visited it, they understood the impact it could have for the community. Neil Robertson. You guys are supposed to come up front, so. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your beautiful paper, Christopher, and the wonderful response, Patricia. Uh, and uh, this is just because I'm completely obsessed with uh, um, thinking about the Paradiso right now and uh, the role of Notre Dame, Our Lady Mary in the Paradiso, but also really in the whole high medieval context, which is part of this sense of the naming of so many churches and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, Christopher, if you could just, um, this is really just to ask you to tease out some of the things that you've already been saying uh, in the sense of, for me, you know, in my deeply Protestant soul, this moment of Mary is a puzzle, which is what makes me kind of deeply interested in it. And it seems to me that in the Paradiso, she functions there as a crucial role because of a certain kind of gap between the order, the hierarchical order of ascent and that final divinization that occurs in the Godhead. And Mary is, you know, the prayer to Mary is the necessary means by which we can have the wings to cross that gap. And the way you're describing Notre Dame in contemporary France is that as a building, it seems to be addressing a similar gap between the secular world and the sacred world. And what I'm wondering is, would any religious building be doing this? Or is it important that it's a church? And is it important that it is a church named Notre Dame and given in her honor. And um, so I think you've been invoking this all along, but if you could just speak to it a little more explicitly about in what sense is Notre Dame crucial to this gap, to my mind, between the secular and the sacred, but also between contemporary France and its own history. Uh, so if you could say just a word or two about that, I'll just disappear. <laughs> Well, thank you for that wonderful, in a way, conclusion to my paper. You, you, you've, you've, you've taken so much of what I said and put it so clearly. Um, three things occur to me, well, maybe two and the third I can leave aside, but um, I think in a way, one of the points of the paper, which I hope came through was that there is relative to this relic, um, an ability or a, a power and a message of a kind of reconciliation. Um, and I think that the way you put it, sacred and secular in the contemporary is a good way of putting it. I think it, it poses the same question that you did yesterday, that, that moment when Beatrice can't take you any further and you need Mary. Um, and I would say just two things about that. One is quite concrete relative to what's in the church. And one has to do with the feminine principle um, and how that's been diffused and refigured in the contemporary. The first is that one of the, one of the things we think of when we think of that, those amazing pictures of the ruins in the hours and days after the cathedral was that the Pieta was still intact. Right, the statue of pity, uh, Mary and Jesus, her, her dead son. And I think that, that that sorrowful mother, that Our Lady of Sorrows, is operative, you might say, in all good works in, in the contemporary. It might be framed in terms of equality, fraternity 
but it's still it's still flowing out of that imagery of you know holding the broken eternal and holding the dead child right um and then the other side of it i think and this might sound a little bit crazy is that precisely because it's our lady our lady it participates in what the french are very proud of and one of the key elements of their concept of laicite which is the integration of the female into conversation in the worldly uh, sphere. And, you know, even when I've lectured on Princesse de Clèves in FIP, that's an element that I try to bring out, how you're seeing this happening. And the French see the distinctiveness of their culture in its relation to secularity versus the sacred, in relation to pluralism versus, um, you know, kind of bottom line Republican uh, principles, they see it very much in terms of that place of women. And I think that that is also an element of the bridging between the secular and the sacred that, that you talked about. Um, and we could probably go on at some length about that, but those are two aspects of it that I think really come home. And then the general point, which is that there is this signifying lady right in the middle of Paris that still has the capacity to move, still has the capacity to, um, you might say, provoke cultural action. This, this debate around the restoration is a phenomenal thing. They had to you know, appoint a full general retired from the army to do it, right? It's, it is what the culture is still very fundamentally. So thank you for the insight and uh, be possible to develop some of those points. I'd like to retrieve one question, if I can, because of the devotion with which this was presented to us. I may not be able to do everything that's required. Um, uh, Ms. Hall Bayer talks about, as a geographer, I take the framework of space as a substrate to what becomes place through time. I don't really see much consideration yet of what the other attributes of that space might be that contribute to its changing meaning through time. Did place exist there before the cathedral or was it merely empty space before human settlement, before Christian conversion, what is unique about that space? That's not the whole question, but that's what I can draw it. Uh, I can start. Okay, and then we will have uh, a word from Katie and then we'll stop, I think. So please, if the hand is going to bring that, please. Another amazing question, and I think Patricia may add something. You mentioned both prehistoric and and then pre-human uh, space. And that's a very tough one to think through. Um, it's certainly the case that there have been archeological discoveries near that setting, which can tell us, for example, exactly what kind of skiffs, little boats were used in the you know, prehistorical period. So it seems to me that as a crossing place, it had a sense, it had the, the function already of place for human intelligence, human civilization of that period. The much more difficult question is what is the nature of that space before we have any human traces at all or before there were any you know, humanoids occupying it? Um, and that I find a very mysterious but profound question. I mean, there's a kind of yeah, there's a sort of a, an availability there. Is that space? Uh, is it is it something pre-spatial? I just I I I perhaps am missing something in the question that would allow me to grab grab onto it somehow. But I, I I appreciate the thought, and it will haunt me. I think for a little while. Uh, Patricia, did you want to uh, add anything to that? Well, I, I think it is a question of how you define your terms. As I understand it in, um, 
in liturgical and, and church history usage. Place refers to a particular uh, locus. Sorry, I have to go to another language, um, a, a, a spot. And there's very little actually written about the theology of place, although uh, Dr. John Inga's thesis, which has since been published as a book, was referred to by Professor Elson. But when theologians and um, church historians and so on talk about space, they're usually talking about the interior of a church and how the different um, sections of a building may be designated for appropriate um, liturgical activities or may help to move you forward. So there's that kind of a distinction between space and place. I'm not sure that that sheds any light on your question, however. I, I, it seems to me that you have a different understanding of the terms. Um, but I think it invites more reflection. So thank you. And, and finally, uh, Katie Weatherly will uh, make a statement or ask a question. Please come right. In. Um, well, I suppose uh, thinking about uh, the burning of the cathedral and just looking forward to our um, talk later today about St. George's, I uh, was sort of thinking through what other images of burning churches do I have? And um, with sort of the recent news about residential schools, I know um, there's been at least three churches burned in the past several weeks, uh, one of them an Anglican church in Brentford that's dearly loved by the indigenous community there. Um, and it got me thinking about whether um, the burning of the Cathedral of Notre Dame uh, would have been received differently by the country um, had it been sort of an act of protest um, as opposed to sort of an accident or perhaps even an act of God. Um, and I think in, in different ways, both of your talks sort of touched on how the burning of the, the cathedral there opened up a possibility of restoration, um, both for kind of not just the building, but the, the city and the people um, and whether or not uh, it's possible for there to be this same opening up of restoration uh, when churches burn sort of at um, the hands of men who are burning them down in the acts of judgment. So uh, that's my question. That is a very demanding question. I mean, I think a lot of people were very relieved when they realized this was an electrical flaw or a cigarette, right? I think people really did not want this to be an act of terror of any kind. So that's one way of, of answering the question. You can just imagine how the reactions would have changed in character if it had been done willingly with some more or less clear agenda behind it. Um, you used the word retribution, I think, and again, it's one of these very tricky kind of re-words that we're facing in these questions, right? They, what sort of return, what sort of restitution, and the key word that we're all thinking about these days, what kind of reconciliation can come out of something like that? And I think it is, you know, it will be each and every time a mystery as to how a destructive act like that could be recuperated within a framework of reconciliation. That's just something I feel hugely inadequate to address beyond that obvious point, right? But the thing that first came to mind when you asked the question was, in the first hours, I think there was some suggestion that the fire at Notre Dame could have been deliberately set. And it changed utterly the, 
the, the shape of the reaction when it was realized that, no, this is just some technical error or some human carelessness there. But thank you for that very demanding question in a, in a very demanding week. So I'm going to call on Canon Peter Harris, please, now to conclude our proceedings for now, and we will reconvene at 2.30 p.m. local time for our final session. Following the usual custom at our conferences, we conclude the morning session with the noonday prayers from the Book of Common Prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all people unto me. Blessed Savior, who at this hour does hang upon the cross, stretching out thy loving arms, grant that all mankind may look unto thee and be saved, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. At midday, O King, I saw a light above the brightness of the sun. Almighty Savior, who at midday didst call thy servant St. Paul, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. We beseech thee to illumine the world with the radiance of thy glory, that all nations may come and worship thee, who art with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Father of mercies, who to thine apostle St. Peter didst reveal in threefold vision thy boundless compassion, Forgive, we pray thee, our unbelief, and so enlarge our hearts and enkindle our zeal. We may fervently desire the salvation of all people and with more ready diligence labor in the extension of thy kingdom. For his sake who gave himself for the life of the world, thy son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, we beseech thee mercifully to hear us and grant that we to whom thou hast given a hearty desire to pray, May by thy mighty aid be defended and comforted in all dangers and adversities through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.